Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Faster, Safer, and Happier Deployments to Kubernetes. My name is Mark Levy. I'll be hosting today's webinar. I focus on product marketing here at Ops MX. Um, let's talk a little, a couple of housekeeping items before uh, we start. Uh, the session today is about 50 minutes long. Uh, we're gonna record today's session. We'll send the recordings and the slides to everyone uh, who attends. Um, if you have questions, please ask the questions uh, in the chat and we'll, we'll answer as many questions as we can. I'd like to talk a little bit about OpsMX. Um, so, you know, we are really dedicated to making the process of continuous delivery easy and successful for you. We have a large number of customers of every size, from the most sophisticated, uh, including Salesforce and Cisco, to organizations who are now highly successful, even though they've had little or no CD experience. When we started, what I'd like to do, if we can, is take a quick poll to understand where you currently are in your continuous delivery or DevOps journey. If you just take a moment to fill out uh, the poll, we'd really appreciate it. And while we're doing that, what I'd like to do is introduce our speaker today, Bob Boulay is a technology enthusiast with a lot of passion. You've probably heard Bob before in our previous webinars. Uh, he really has a knack for helping others understand how things work. Uh, and uh, he comes with uh, over uh, 19 years of experience in sales engineering. He's known for his dynamic and interactive spinnaker and continuous integration and continuous delivery uh, presentations. Bob, how are you doing today? I'm hanging in there, Mark. Thank you for uh, what I can only describe as a very generous introduction. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Why don't you just take it from here then? And uh, all right, my friend. It. Great, great. So, 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 guys. Um, first off, uh, I want to echo the sentiment that that Mark had, had made earlier. Thank you all for spending time with us today. I know, uh, you know, we're all extremely busy, and um, you know, I want to make sure that. Um, you know, we, when we ask you to come to one of these things that you get some value out of it. So uh, really looking forward to, to sort of diving into the material. Um, you know, uh, as Mark had said, you know, I want you to feel free to ask questions. Uh, if for some reason we don't get to a question that you've asked, um, don't worry. Uh, I will make sure that I follow up with you with an answer to your question. Uh, also, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to display some contact information. Um, if you want to, you know, have a deeper conversation or want to talk to me a little bit about your specific set of circumstances, uh, I do that all the time, and I'm happy to sort of spend some time, uh, you know, carving out some time with individuals if uh, if there are additional questions once we're we're done with today's session. So um, today, you know, we're, we're talking about deployments to Kubernetes. And, you know, I, th I think, um, you know, uh, I, I, I'm going to date myself a bit here. You know, um, I, I actually remember back a uh, world before Kubernetes existed, right? So I lived through, you know, sort of the evolution of Docker and Docker Swarm and Docker Compose and all of those sort of orchestration layers, right? And, and now, you know, um, you know, Kubernetes has seemed to be eating the world as it relates to, you know, sort of the orchestration for containers. And, you know, I think um, with that though, you know, sort of comes some challenges, right? So, uh, but I, th I think, you know, looking at, at, at Kubernetes as a, a, an avenue to do large scale application deployments, uh, to be able to break your applications down into microservices and orchestrate uh, their launching, um, you know, to be able to effectively and efficiently utilize the hardware that you have at your disposal, or, you know, like a lot of us are doing, you know, make things very portable and, and move them to the cloud. Um, you know, the scaling and self-healing of the containers and all of the, uh, the bits that go into Kubernetes that provide us with that scaling and self-healing, uh, again, you know, making for a truly sort of cloud native experience, right? I mean, you know, and, and, and that, that term gets tossed around a lot. And I think, you know, uh, I, I was having a, a beer with with uh, some friends, uh, you know, back before the t pandemic, and uh, you know, it was about you know talking to them a little bit about you know where did the the cloud native bit come you know come from, and and you know we're talking about how you know when I deploy something to Amazon or when I deploy something to to GCP. I, it's a fire and forget. Like I don't have to worry about it. They're they're watching it for me, and and so you know, getting to a place where I could now 
or, uh, orchestrate my applications and you know ultimately design my applications uh, so that I could get that same experience with a little bit more control. Um, you know, and obviously um, the ecosystem that surrounds Kubernetes, right? So that has started to pop up, right? So you know, templating engines like Helm and Customize have, have come out and, and in an effort to make life easier in terms of deploying these things. Um, you know, uh, the thing we're going to talk about today, Spinnaker, right? So Spinnaker being that sort of uh, Kubernetes first type of deployment strategy or orchestration layer, it supports a lot of other deployment technologies, but obviously uh, being a Kubernetes based application, uh, it also uh, it does a really tight job in terms of integrating with with uh, with Kubernetes uh, on the Spinnaker side, and then you know technologies like Prometheus, um, you know, and, and Prometheus is one of those projects. Uh, my, my last organization, I was working for a, an organization that um, uh, was was producing time series databases or, or turning Postgres into a time series database, and you know obviously working with Prometheus quite a bit there. Uh, again, an amazing, you know, sort of technology from a, you know, sort of a monitoring perspective. And then all of the traffic shaping technologies that are out there. And so, you know, enabling me now to be able to very easily and natively do things like canary deployments or blue green deployments uh, using some of those those traffic shaping layers. So obviously lots of, of reasons to use Kubernetes, right? It's not a tough sell for some of us, right? I mean, um, and so, you know, being able to sort of get into a mode where I'm deploying my applications like this and architecting my applications like this um, is really something that is very attractive to a lot of us. Now, some of the challenges, right? So we start looking about or thinking about because nothing's free, right, guys? Every time, you know, you, you, you see something that's always going to be um, you know, a, an issue or a challenge that we have to overcome, right? It's, it's, there's no utopia just yet. And so, you know, um, you know, some of the things that we can find in terms of pain points, uh, cumbersome application deployments with multiple K, K, uh, Kubernetes resources. So that there's a lot going on, right? In terms of managing this, right? And so Kubernetes is architected to be able to do all that, but the actual implementation of that can be a little bit difficult, right? So, you know, the, the, the platform itself is well thought through, uh, but, you know, with anything that is so feature rich and so, uh, I guess we could call it flexible and extensible, uh, there's gonna, complications just simply arise, right? It's a complicated product. Um, you know, parameterized deployments, you know, uh, different types of files, deployments, services, config files, secrets, uh, all of these things need to be orchestrated or need to be ultimately pushed up as part of an application stack. Um, you know, and then, then if we start looking at, you know, sort of how do I want to package uh, these Kubernetes applications, right? I've got Helm, I've got Customize, just to name a couple in terms of my templating engines. Uh, and sort of, you know, uh, if, if I'm packaging them like that, if my developers are packaging like that, what are my deployment challenges there? Um, and then, you know, obviously version control uh, and rollbacks, you know, we want to make sure we keep a close eye on those things. Um, you know, the ability to go ahead, you know, of course, the underlying platform is capable of this, but it's the actual doing of it that becomes the challenge. And we want to make sure that we're, we're addressing that, um, you know, managing deployments. Uh, to multiple Kubernetes clusters, right? I mean, you know, I, I, I was talking to a, a you know a, a company a few weeks back who, you know, basically has, has told us that you know uh, they've decided to to start the process of of going uh, multi cloud and multi Kubernetes clusters and deploying to those things, you know, sort of simultaneously. Uh, and they were looking for a tool to sort of bring all that together. And you know, they want to be able to do things like rolling upgrades across these two clusters that are running in different cloud providers. Uh, and then, you know, uh, the other piece of this is, you know, uh, canary and blue green type of deployments, right? So what's the best approach there? You know, I mean, um, you know, do I, do I take and, and write a, a series of groovy scripts that are going to go ahead and ultimately perform those functions? And, you know, I have to maintain those, or do I look for an orchestration layer that's going to ultimately help me uh, roll that out again, that has sort of deep roots in Kubernetes and can ultimately help me do that. So, you know, I, again, I think, you know, a lot of these things um, can lead to a lot of, you know, sort of those hidden costs, right? So the high cost of maintenance, you know, of these things, right? So if these are not sort of, let me write the script and run the same thing over and over again for the next 15 years. They need to be maintained. We need to be evaluating them against uh, the various versions of Kubernetes that I'm deployed against. And, uh, you know, obviously your DevOps team, 
you know, they go from, you know, sort of being that team that, that sort of ushers things from when they, they leave source control all the way through to a deployment. Now they've got to play, you know, sort of a game of whack-a-mole with, you know, all these scripts and worrying about, you know, is it maintained? Is it up to date? Um, you know, uh, if, if let's say, for an example, I'm using a CI plugin to do this and that CI plugin, um, you know, suddenly there's a vulnerability that's been exposed there, but I can't upgrade yet because, you know, the version of, of Jenkins I'm using or the version of Travis I'm using doesn't support it. So, you know, there's a lot of things there that, that make this difficult. And I think what I want to talk about today is how we can unify these things, how we can, you know, sort of. Uh, make, you know, sort of a single orchestration tool uh, the center of our universe here uh, to make this easy, right? And to, to manage some of these difficult things uh, through that, that level of orchestration, uh, and that being Spinnaker. Now, um, uh, now that we've sort of set the stage a little bit, I'm going to give um, a, a talk that I, I give all the time. And the reason I give this part of the talk pretty consistently uh, with any of my webinars is because I really believe this, guys. Um, I really believe having, you know, been in this business for a while, um, you know, that, that these are truly the challenges that we face, right? And I think that, you know, um, when we look at velocity, we look at risk, and we look at quality, uh, again, those of you that have heard me speak before know that I'm not suggesting that, you know, these are um, insurmountable, you know, uh, things to manage, uh, especially if you're only having to manage one or two of them, right? And, and you know, depending on sort of where you are and where your organization is in that sort of uh, DevOps maturity curve, uh, you may only have to manage one or two or, or of these things, right? So, you know, you may be focused on velocity and quality. Uh, risk isn't really coming into play yet because you're a smaller software startup. Um, but I would, I would tell you that, that the challenge here is managing all three of these things effectively at the same time. Um, you know, I want to make sure that I can deliver at the pace that my business requires. I want to make sure that I'm, you know, uh, managing both compliance and security risk along with policy risk. Right. And so, you know, and policy can be looked at in a number of different ways. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in, in the presentation. Uh, but I also don't want to expose my users to badness. Right. I need to maintain a level of quality. And, and while left of deployment, there are a lot of tools that are, are attempting to ensure that. Right. Um, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, as we start to increase our velocity and the pressure starts to come to increase our velocity uh, and, you know, sort of that more declarative uh, deployment model starts to sort of take hold where I want to go from, you know, the the uh, the pull request approval and merge to master to a deployment in production. I don't want to I want to measure that with a stopwatch, not a sundial. And that's where things get hard, right? That's where things become very, very difficult to make sure that you're maintaining that level of performance across all three of these. And again, you know, pick any two and, and you know, uh, we, our goal here is to make sure you're always able to deliver on all three. Um, I'm not a big fan of these types of things, but this one here struck me uh, because I, I feel like it's the one thing that, that you know, um, we can look at and say, this seems reasonable. Um, you know, it was a Gartner study. It was done back in 2017, but I still think it holds today. Um, you know, uh, faster application delivery is going to increase your failure rates. In a lot of cases, those cracks start to show based on inadequate tooling. Um, if you don't have the right tools, you know, it was one thing if you were deploying daily or you were deploying twice or three times a day. When you start to get up to uh, a, a higher rate or faster rate that you need to deploy at, those tools that were servicing you back when it was once or twice a day are going to create problems for you or potentially create problems for you when you try and turn the volume up on that, right? And try and, and get to a place where you're driving to, to make sure that 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 code that's being written is ultimately delivering value out to your, your user base in the shortest period of time possible. Uh, and that's where those cracks start to show. And that's why I think you know this becomes a, a, a very sort of a stand the test of time uh, type of study. Uh, and I, I, I really, uh, that's why I use it quite a bit. Um, you know, and of course, you know, when we start thinking about friction pro points and problem spaces, you know, obviously there's an automation problem, right? So, you know, uh, if you're if you're doing your deployments and you're not using, you know, sort of any sort of automation or any sort of orchestration, uh, there are potential problems there. And we talked about them a little earlier about, you know, manual scripting and things of that nature. 
Um, but you know, again, I think, you know, there's also, um, you know, how do I automate, uh, some of the standard checks, right? So, uh, gatekeepers at every stage or, maybe an automated gatekeeper versus a human gatekeeper. Um, you know, am I doing any risk verification and diagnostic work? Am I looking at, you know, as I deploy this canary, what data driven, how am I making that data driven decision to either roll this thing back or push it forward? Right. And so we want to make sure that we have the tooling to be able to sort of make that decision. Uh, and we, what we don't want to do guys. And by the way, my presentations are always set against the backdrop of, I don't want you to have to stop your pipeline, go look for a problem, not find a problem, and then continue. What I wanted to do is only stop your pipeline when your tooling indicates to you that there is a problem. Uh, this is going to allow us to achieve that that velocity. Um, you know, obviously policy and security checks. I mean, you know, um, with with progressive delivery and and you know the idea that I want my developers now want to be able to make changes to code and ultimately have that pushed out to production as quickly as possible. Uh, one of the things that, that I want to talk about today a little bit later in the presentation is how do I stand up these guardrails? How do I make sure that, you know, because, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, most of the, the uh, engineers and software developers I work with, I look at these folks as superhuman people, but even superhuman people sometimes make mistakes. And so we have to make sure we have, and, we, and I want to free them from having to worry about those things. I want them to know that, right of where they sit in the process, there are security checks and policy guardrails that are up there that'll make sure that any mistake that, that, that happens that they happen to make would get caught. And so if, if I've accidentally forgot to update something and suddenly now I'm trying to de deploy a database to a, you know, a DMZ, I want something in the process to be able to catch that. I didn't do it on purpose. Um, I'm, I'm moving quickly and it happened. And so I want to make sure I've got something there and I don't want to burden my developers with worrying about it. And then obviously, you know, some of the security risk pieces, right? So, you know, uh, my organization has invested a lot in uh, going out and buying tools like, uh, you know, SonarCube or Coverity or uh, Black Duck or TwistLock, right? Uh, again, I don't want to necessarily have to stop my pipeline to go look at these things and say, ah, I didn't find anything. Great, I can continue. I'd love to be able to automate that process and say, hey, what were the results here, right? And bump it up against maybe a policy gate that says this is what was expected. Uh, and if I don't see any problems, the pipeline automation simply continues. So those are the friction points and problem spaces, especially, and these become magnified because we, we really want to, in a Kubernetes world, because we've broken our application architecture down to microservices, the idea is, is I should be able to iterate fast, right? I should be able to, to make changes. Those changes need to get pushed. And so we're going we're gonna to go through some sample pipelines today to sort of show you how some of that might work, right? But I think uh, more importantly, the, 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 we can't forego some of these items here. Um, you know, that, that'd be like saying, I'm only going to focus on velocity. I'm going to forget the other two legs of my stool. So we're going to talk today about how to satisfy all three. So, um, and I, I promise you, we're coming to the end of the slides here. So, so, you know, the, the anatomy of a solution, you know, is really about, um, stabilizing those three legs of those stools. And, and, and the key here guys is, you know, having a command and control layer, that allows for the automation, right? So I need automation equals velocity, right? If I can automate, I can move faster. And then the only thing I have to figure out at that point is how do I manage risk and quality? And you know, if I can do the risk piece of this through automation and I can do the quality piece of this through automation, boy, now I've, I've suddenly got something I'm cooking with gas. I can ultimately know that the only time my pipeline is gonna stop now is if there's a real problem. And I can squeeze out all those times that I've had to stop my process and go looking for one. Um, and so that's you know sort of what we're trying to get to. And that's the core of what OpsMX is trying to do. If I could throw a quick commercial in for, for sort of my company, that's sort of what we're trying to accomplish here and empower our DevOps you know, engineers and, and our customers and prospects to be able to do. Uh, and again, you know, I think I talked about this, you know, uh, just now, but, you know, automation, you know, in terms of testing and in terms of, you know, um, my pipelines being able to be, you know, uh, to be run based on uh, or be, being able to build in uh, error handling in my pipelines to be able to sort of roll things back. 
Um, you know, if I'm an organization that's looking to do progressive rollouts, uh, or if I want to go ahead and actually start to do canaries, you know, the automation process of, you know, what is the the quality of this application? Uh, do I see any anomalies in the logs and metrics, right? Um, you know, and again, you know, the other thing that I, I talk to people a lot about is, you know, sort of once you have that sort of underlying orchestration there, uh, you also need visibility and you need to have a system of record, right? We can't forego knowing what happened and when it happened, right? Nor do I feel like going diving around in logs to find that stuff. I want to be able to make sure that if, if I have to go through a SOX 2 audit, that I can ultimately sit down with that auditor and show that person, here's what happened, here's when it happened, and here was the data that was associated with this. These were the JIRA tickets. These were the ServiceNow uh, open items that were approved. These were, this is where Black Duck, you know, returned its results. So I want to be able to, to sort of automate those things, but I also want to make sure that I have a, a record of them as well. And again, this all folds into Kubernetes because Kubernetes is really that system that's designed to help us deliver faster. And so we need to make sure that we maintain these other elements of the stool while we're ultimately delivering faster. So enough of slides, right? Uh, I've got, you know, let, let's look at some real world examples. And so what I wanna do guys is I wanna start showing you guys some real world examples here around, you know, Spinnaker and, and Kubernetes. Let's take a, a quick walking tour of this. Um, let's do a sample deployment. Let's take a look at GitOps and triggering uh, a pipeline based on a change made by a developer and that commit to master. Um, and let's look at, you know, sort of how we could handle uh, a values.yaml change and a Helm chart type of rollout. Uh, complex deployments, we'll take a look at, you know, sort of rolling and atomic updates. Um, automating decision gates and using data aggregation and automated policy to evaluate these, these releases, right? Uh, again, uh, a part that, you know, in order to maintain that level of velocity that you're getting from Kubernetes, we want to make sure that those guardrails are up, but they're automated. I don't want to stop, right? I don't want to stop and look. Um, and then obviously looking at things like quality, continuous verification by looking at logs and metrics and looking to spot anomalies, right? So, Again, I don't want to uh, stop and say, let me go and grep logs looking for certain error messages. I want to look for anomalies. I want a system that is automated that will collect these logs, look for anomalies, and then produce a score or produce an outcome, right, that I can evaluate against. And then obviously uh, logging and auditing. Let's inspect what we expect, right? Let's make sure that, you know, we're empowered. Uh, we can turn our, our developers loose knowing that, we have a log and visibility into everything that's going on. What's deployed where? Um, how it's deployed? Um, you know, the interaction with that deployment through Spinnaker. Um, so all of that stuff we'll cover as part of the demo. So let me let me uh, get rid of these slides and, and start going through it. So um, where I like to start is with a, a really basic pipeline, right? And let me uh, let me show you how this is configured. So. Obviously, you know, one of the things that that um, we have going for us here with some a tool like Spinnaker, especially in a Kubernetes environment is, you know, it's fully supportive of, you know, all the Kubernetes APIs, everything is sort of built right in, you don't have to worry about writing scripts, you don't have to worry about interacting with Kubernetes and how you're going to interact with Kubernetes when it comes to the deployment, I'm able to orchestrate this thing end to end. Uh, and ultimately um, not have to worry about any of that maintenance. And so let's take a walk through what this looks like. So all of these things are gonna start with a triggering event. Now with Kubernetes and sort of a, a declarative type of deployment model, uh, typically we wanna monitor our source code repository. Uh, in this case here, uh, I'm monitoring GitLab, right? I've got a GitLab project that uh, is gonna ultimately go ahead and when there's a commit to uh, the master branch is ultimately going to trigger uh, this pipeline. However, I'm not, you know, sort of limited to that, right? Um, depending on sort of how I want to design this, right? Uh, I could listen for a Jenkins job, or I could look for a new Helm chart to be published in a, in a Helm repo. Uh, I could look at an artifactory repository for uh, a manifest to get pushed to. Um, I could run jobs on a cron. The idea behind this, guys, is that I, you know, this is the the inflection point for uh, my, my pipelines, right? And especially in Kubernetes, uh, depending on sort of what I've got for tooling left of deployment, um, I wanna go ahead and actually, I can drop Spinnaker in, 
and be as least disruptive because I can trigger based on almost any one of these things. And so it makes it really simple to get going there, right? Now, in this case here, I've got a webhook that's coming from GitLab. I've got the GitLab repo up and we'll, we're gonna actually do a, a, a live demo of this. So uh, fingers crossed. Um, the next part of the, the pipeline is uh, this Jenkins job, right? And so, um, you know, I'm gonna make a change to a values.yaml that's sitting out uh, in GitLab. Uh, GitLab's gonna, gonna tell Spinnaker that this change is made and it's time to go. Um, and then ultimately that first stop is my Jenkins job. Jenkins is gonna go ahead and clone the repo and ultimately build the Helm chart artifact for me. Uh, that's ultimately gonna get deposited into a, a Google bucket. Um, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Um, now, in terms of working with things like templating engines in Kubernetes, um, you know, we support, uh, the product supports Helm 2, Helm 3, and Customize. So really depending on sort of what you want to use for a templating engine, um, it's there and available to you. But here, again, you know, when it comes to Spinnaker, uh, I've got this, this predefined step to bake my manifest. I don't have to worry about, again, scripting this, right? So here's, I'm going to bake this manifest. I want to deploy it. Uh, I want to give the deployment this name. I want to deploy it to this namespace. Uh, and then guess what? Here's the artifact that Jenkins just produced, right? It's sitting in a Google bucket. Here it is. Uh, Spinnaker is going to go grab that, right? And ultimately, it's going to create its own artifact because what it's going to do is it's going to take the Helm chart and it's going to distill the manifest that I need in order to deploy. And it's going to use uh, wonderful Catfish 80. It's the naming uh, engine in Spinnaker is just, that's worth the price of admission just by itself. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and deploy. Now, again, with Kubernetes, um, you know, it's very, very simple. Um, you know, in order to, to generate or to add my Kubernetes clusters as targets, I've got, and this is where OpsMX comes in. I make this very, very simple, right? Um, OpsMX actually allows you to, through our, our, our intelligent software delivery stack, allows you to actually create an agent. That agent simply gets deployed. That agent could be sitting behind a bastion. It could be sitting behind a firewall or something else, but I'm just gonna deploy that agent. And ultimately uh, that agent gets pushed out to the, uh, the, the, uh, the cluster. And now that cluster becomes a target for my Spinnaker deployments. Uh, so it's very, very simple. I don't have to go and grab the kube config file and then port the kube config file over. It's a simple, safe, and secure agent-based deployment. Um, and so here, you know, I'm gonna choose the account. In this case here, I've, it's just my, my, my home lab. So I've only got one, uh, but it's, it's the default uh, cluster. I'm gonna, again, give it a namespace. I'm gonna tell it to deploy this artifact, which is the artifact that was, that was just built back here as a result of me distilling my Helm artifact or my Helm chart. Uh, and then ultimately, I'm gonna go ahead and deploy that to production. And then, you know, here I've built in a weight to simulate sort of a, a manual judgment. And then one of the things that I'm doing here is, you know, um, and, and one of the things that I want to, I want to bring up is I can ultimately do things like add rollback pieces here, right? So here I could actually delete this manifest if I wanted to. So um, as I go through and do the deployment, uh, I could run this delete manifest based on a conditional step, right? So if I had a step, let's say I injected a continuous verification here. Uh, I looked at the logs, I looked at the metrics, and instead of a score of 100, I wound up with a score of 60. Fairly alarming. Um, I could use this delete manifest and run that conditionally. And if um, you know this, this deployment happened, and then this step here was that continuous verification and it came back as that score, then it would only then would this then trigger this delete manifest. Otherwise, if the score comes back as 100, uh, I stop and I don't do this delete manifest. And so I can start to build my error logic in here. I can start to script that error logic uh, around how I wanna automate rollbacks and how I wanna evaluate these things as they're being pushed out. And so it's really a powerful orchestration tool for direct use with Kubernetes. It really allows you to do a lot of those things that are, are more difficult to do. It, it would take more time to write a script to be able to do this. And then that script would have to be maintained here. I don't have to maintain it. I've got a product that is being maintained by an extremely robust community, along with 
uh, a vendor like OpsMX. So, you know, this is the basics. Now let's, let's go in here and uh, this is where um, it always gets tricky, right? So let me come in here and actually do a live demo um, here. And guys, this is not a, uh, uh, scripted at all. I'm, I'm doing this on the fly here. So we'll see uh, what happens. I'm going to go ahead and I'm, I'm looking at the repo here uh, for this uh, Nginx deployment. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and actually just do a quick edit. And what I want to do is I want to edit, um, just I want to scale the thing, right? So let me just go ahead and make a, a simple change to the, the number of replicas, right? Go ahead and commit that change. Now, what's going to happen here is that's going to trigger this pipeline, as you can see, it did that, right? And so now that change that was committed to master has triggered my pipeline. The first thing it's doing is it's running this Jenkins job. So Jenkins has gone ahead and, and, and run that job. Um, that job was successful. Now it's gone ahead and come to the next stage here where it went ahead and actually baked my manifest. And so if I want to look here, this is the manifest that it distilled from that Helm chart, right? And ultimately, it's gone ahead and deployed that update or that change for me. Now, if I come over here, what I'll be able to see is, see, there's the old deployment with uh, just two. If I refresh this view, I'll see the third, there's the third set, right? So now I've gone ahead and scaled this and it's ultimately deployed it. I can look at the information here uh, about this. I can look at the replica set. I can understand what's happening. Uh, this is V4. Uh, V3, V2, this is how I'm versioning these things. So if I ever needed to do a rollback, uh, let's say if I decided to, uh, I had a break glass scenario and I didn't have time to go through the pipeline process all over again. You know, one of the things I can do here is I can, I can do a rollback, I can undo a rollout uh, and very quickly go back to the previous version, which was V3, right? So this is that sort of deep rooted integration with Kubernetes that I'm getting here, right? And, you know, again, um, you know, being able to go ahead and go from a change to my source code uh, all the way out to, you know, that deployment and automating that process, right? So that makes, allows it to happen extremely fast and again, really streamlined, right? Um, you know, and, and ultimately, you know, give me what I want, which is I want those changes that need to get made or they're being made by my developers to those microservices to be deployed very quickly. So that's, that's a, what I would call a, a Fisher-Price uh, type of deployment, right? Very linear, uh, very simple, uh, very easy to understand to Kubernetes. Now, um, something that's a little bit more complicated uh, that I think is, is, is sort of worth going through is sort of uh, this rolling upgrade scenario, right? Now here, what I'm doing is, is I'm ultimately going through the process of deploying uh, new code, that's coming from, again, I'm just grabbing an artifact, um, you know, and ultimately deploying it, right? So I'm gonna grab that artifact. Um, now here, again, this is where I get, you know, all of those clusters that I have available to me as targets, but I'm gonna grab that artifact and I'm gonna deploy it. Uh, now I've got this artifact, it's sitting behind a, a load balancer or an ingress controller. Uh, and now what I wanna do with it is, bef now in the meantime, as I've deployed this, all of the traffic is still going to my old code, right? My old deployment. And so now I wanna start the process of using, uh, in this case here, Kubernetes ingress controller to start to slowly direct traffic to this new deployment. So I'm gonna start by sending 30% of the traffic there. And once I've done that, I wanna go ahead and ultimately do a, a validation. Now we're gonna look at what a validation looks like here a little bit later in the session, but I wanna validate or have some process that validates that nothing's going wrong. I've sent 30% of the traffic there, everything looks fine. Now, I also wanna be able to do a rollback, right? So if I do find a problem, I want this to be atomic, right? I wanna get all the way through it. And each step along the way, I wanna look at, oh, something went wrong, roll this back and stop the pipeline, right? So if in this validation step, I find a problem, this step here, it'll fork out to this. And ultimately, as you can see here, if, if the, the manual judgment step is reject, it's gonna fork out and run this. If, if the manual judgment step isn't reject, this step never runs and I move on to my next traffic split, right? But at each step along the way, I have a circuit breaker that will roll me back. 
Uh, I have an evaluation step where I'm going to go ahead and actually, again, and I'll show you this in a moment, but I'll use logs and metrics to ultimately determine or spot any anomalies while this is happening. Uh, and again, you know, I'm just using all of the sort of core Kubernetes elements here, right? I'm deploying via Kubernetes. I'm using that, that Kubernetes ingress controller to be able to do this. I could be using some other traffic shaping. I've, um, uh, we've got a customer that uses AppMesh. Uh, and so we were able to go ahead and work with them to, to sort of show them how to go ahead and ultimately split that traffic using AppMesh uh, in an EKS cluster, right? So, but again, I think as we go through this process and then ultimately, you know, uh, that last validation after my 100% traffic shaping, this then becomes a blue green scenario, right? So here I am, I'm at 100%. Now I wanna go ahead and make that decision. Do I scale down my blue? right? Uh, or, you know, do I roll back my green, right? And then ultimately rolling back my green is essentially just redirecting all the traffic to blue at that point. Uh, but then ultimately provide those automation steps to start tearing down uh, the rest of those deployments that are no longer needed. So again, that tight integration with Kubernetes, that ability to do these things, do these types of scenarios without having to write, you know, lots of scripting without having to sort of maintain a bunch of scripts. We're going to make this really easy to sort of interact with Kubernetes. And again, you know, I think that um, being able to go ahead and add these traffic validation steps, um, again, gives you, gives your developers peace of mind that we're doing this safely, that, you know, we're not putting or exposing our users, as I said in my previous slide, to badness. Um, so, you know, that's another you know, sort of type of scenario. The other thing that makes, you know, the tool very, very powerful, you know, because I think that, you know, um, no matter sort of what we're doing, um, we're eventually going to run into a situation where we actually want to run some scripts, right? We need to run some scripts. I may need to, I may want to run, um, you know, a cloud formation script, or I may want to deploy something to App Engine that, that I've got a script for, right? I, I can do that with this tool as well. And again, you know, using Kubernetes to do it, right? So I can go ahead and fetch the script here. Uh, and ultimately, you know, the tool itself is going to go ahead and actually create the config map. I'm going to go ahead and mount that config map inside of a container and actually run that, that thing. And I'm ultimately going to get a response, right? Or I'm going to get, um, I can monitor or capture output uh, from the logs or from the artifact itself, right? So uh, again, you know, that level of flexibility that we're giving you here to interact with Kubernetes, uh, still give you the ability to sort of run scripts where you need to, um, be able to go ahead and actually respond or, or, or get into the sort of more of the more declarative deployment models by monitoring your source code repositories and pushing those things out. Um, the other pipeline that I had that I thought you guys might be interested in, and I wanted to walk through this just because I know um, this was written by one of my colleagues, you know, sort of more managed releases, right? When we start to go down that process of things like injecting a bomb into the pipeline, right? So we want to start to define, um, you know, dynamically based on, again, you know, going and retrieving a file or retrieving a set of artifacts from a source code repository or from an artifact repository, and then using those variables inside to ultimately uh, define what's deployed, right? So again, if I look here, you know, I can inject my bomb into the pipeline. And again, I'm using a Kubernetes job to do that, right? Uh, and I'm going out and, and injecting or grabbing that bomb file and defining the variables that are associated with that bomb file. And then ultimately, I'm using those variables that are sitting inside of that bill of materials file to then ultimately go ahead and actually uh, use those inside of my Kubernetes manifests, right? So again, uh, something very, very simple to be able to go ahead and actually uh, orchestrate this, uh, what, what can be a very complex pipeline uh, by pulling those things down or pulling those that bill of materials down uh, you know, parameterizing my pipeline based on the variables that are in there and ultimately going through the process of, you know, leveraging those, those parameters uh, as I go ahead and actually do my deployment to Kubernetes. And so again, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, sort of simplifying this, making it easy, making sure that it's, um, you know, very simple and easy to be able to do, um, you know, in terms of, you know, making sure that I've, I have a repeatable process um, you know, all the while, again, cutting down on because I've got a tool like this that's orchestrating at the center of my process, um, you know, to the left is, you know, all of my DevOps tools, to the right are all my deployment targets. 
uh, and I've got this tool sitting in the middle, I get to, to short circuit the time it, it takes me to sort of build stuff like this out. Um, so this is really, again, something that's really exciting to me uh, when, it, when it comes to making sure that I can maintain a level of velocity that Kubernetes affords me. Uh, I can go in and make those types of changes to the application layer or at the microservices layer and get those things deployed very quickly. Um, now, this is sort of how we're going to be able to do that from an orchestration perspective. Um, the other side of this, the other side of this, and, and moving fast is great. And that's really what we want to do. We want to make sure that we're getting those things from the, the fingertips or the keyboards of our developers out to a place where it's adding value to our users. However, um, those of us that are in, you know, sort of semi-regulated environments or have, uh, you know, started that, we're on that, that sort of, you know, maturity curve where we're starting to look at, you know, sort of how do we make sure that we don't wind up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal as it relates to things like security? Um, how do I go about making sure that, that I'm, I'm incorporating those things into my pipeline? And that's really where, uh, you know, sort of OpsMX really comes into the mix, right? And so this is really where, um, you know, I can take what I just talked to you about and, you know, all the velocity that goes along with that and start the process of automating uh, some of these things, right? Start the process of automating the management of risk, right? So as an example, you know, I can come in here and I can create an approval gate, right? Now, for some of us, again, we're in a, a, an environment where, um, you know, if, if, if I were to look at, you know, sort of things like Sarbanes-Oxley, where I have to make sure that, yes, my developer can trigger the process to uh, start a deployment, but I can't have a direct line from my developer to my production environment. I have to have a separation of duties, right? Just in case there's a bad actor somewhere in that mix. And so here, uh, one of the things I'm able to do is ultimately start to inject this concept of approval gates, right? Now, approval gates are not something new, right? Of, of course, not for Spinnaker. Spinnaker has had this concept of manual judgment steps for a while. What's different here, though, is that we're going to go out and collect all the data that's associated with your DevOps tool chain. So I'm going to go get the Jenkins information, the Git information, uh, the SonarCube scan data, the Black Duck scan data. Uh, I'm going to go and, and gather up the JIRA tickets and the, and the ServiceNow tickets. And I'm going to bring those all into one spot right? For, for two reasons. One, I don't want the person that has to approve this to go looking in all these different places. Uh, I want them to be able to look at one spot and ultimately be able to approve and reject very quickly. The other is I want to create a system of record here. I want to be able to uh, look an auditor in the eye and say, this was the status of these things when this deployment happened. And so by collecting all that information, uh, I have that system of record. Now, where it gets even more exciting is when I start to think about this from an automation perspective. So let's say as an example, I want to automate some of these things, right? So I want to evaluate the sonar cube or the coverity scan or the uh, look for at the, uh, at the JIRA tickets. I want to automate that process. I want to take the human out of it. And I just want them to be able to, to know that those things were already passed and then ultimately approve and reject. So what I can do here is I can add some automation by evaluating the data here using our policy manager, right? So now what I've got is a very fast process from, I just made a change to, to source code. It was approved and merged to master. I've started my process. I've done my Jenkins build. Uh, I'm gonna then go ahead now and do my policy check. My policy check can fold in. Here are the expected results from Black Duck. Here are the expected results from SonarCube. I'm looking for pass fails here. Right. And I could ultimately automate the entire security approval process based on those tools doing their job and ultimately me being able to interpret that data. And so, again, you know, adding policy management to this eliminates the need for the developer or the dev SecOps professional to need to worry about whether or not those scans were included or the results of those scans were included. They're in the pipeline. There's logic in the pipeline that makes sure that they were included. Um, the policy manager also is a very effective tool for doing things like if you're using Terraform or you're using some other uh, uh, Pulumi or some other sort of infrastructure as code to build things out 
uh, in front of your deployments. I can then now start the process of enforcing uh, whether or not that cluster was configured correctly, or whether or not this deployment is going to the right namespace, or whether or not this deployment uh, is using uh, ports in its, its ingress that are in line with my, my corporate policy. So I can start to put those guardrails up. I mentioned earlier about how you know, a developer who simply forgets to update one configuration file can suddenly deploy something where it's not supposed to be. I want to alleviate that, that concern so that they know that there's right of where they sit, there are these guardrails here. Um, and then, you know, when we start talking about things like, um, you know, looking at continuous verification, you know, here I start to get into a scenario and let me find uh, an effective uh, one here that I think would make sense. Um, you know, I think when we start looking at these things uh, and we start thinking about sort of um, you know, sort of the continuous verification piece of this, I always like to, to make sure that we can automate that process. And so uh, let me just find the right one here. Uh, and I'll just, yeah, there we go. That should do the trick. And so when we start looking at these things, uh, and we start looking at, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of what we're doing here, in terms of continuous verification and quality. Uh, as I run that canary or as I run that progressive deployment, as I was showing you guys earlier, one of the things that I'm, I wanna be able to do is I wanna be able to tap into those log and metric sources. And I want a system that's gonna automate the process of surfacing anomalies, right? But I also want that system to be able to take feedback right? Um, because, you know, I'm in a very dynamic and fast paced environment. And so here, what we're doing is, is we're tapping into Prometheus, uh, Datadog, uh, Elastic, and we're grabbing metrics and logs. And we're, we're, we're sort of showing you the things that look like they're anomalous, right? They, we've never seen them before in the context of this application. And so we want to bring those to the surface, right? We want you to be able to look at them. Uh, we also take the liberty of classifying these things. So, you know, if it looks like a warning or an error or a critical warning, um, we're ultimately going to be able to go ahead and actually surface these things and ultimately do the same thing with metrics, ultimately deriving a score from this, right? So we're going to get a score that says, hey, we didn't see anything anomalous. The score is 100. It passes. Great. Anything that we see that looks anomalous is going to ding that score. It's going to go from 100 to something less than 100, right? And we can start to set those thresholds. Um, and ultimately, by being able to do this, you're looking below the covers. Uh, you're also inviting your SREs and your developers to come in and say, okay, we stopped this pipeline. Let's do a postmortem on what's going on here. Uh, I could come in here as a developer and say, you know, this is actually just a database warm-up problem. Let's go ahead and ignore. And what it's going to do is it's not just categorizing the message. It's, it's the algorithm that we're using is looking at the message in the context of where it sits in terms of when the application started. And ultimately, it's going to ignore this type of, of log cluster uh, and ultimately allow you to go ahead and actually allow the, the algorithm to get better at surfacing those things and the things that you don't want to see. Um, you know, are, 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 are you know, uh, based on that feedback. The other thing that we're doing here is if you do find a problem, we're going to classify that problem. We're going to allow you to go ahead and say, here was the root cause of this issue. And if it appears again down the road, say six months from now, this thing shows up again, this log cluster, we're going to be able to, you know, you'll be able to access the documentation here. It'll have been tagged. And it will, you know, if it's a regression, it's something that you can do about it, but you're not going and hunting around for what's the problem. I've already fixed this problem. I don't want to see it again. I don't want to have to go fix it again, right? Or I don't want to have to go do root cause analysis on it again. So those are the kinds of guardrails, guys, that again, uh, as we start to move faster using an orchestration layer like Kubernetes, as we start to encourage that sort of um, code to prod, and we want to compress the time frame. We can do all that. We have the tools to do it. We have things like Spinnaker to be able to do that, but we want to make sure that we're not ignoring uh, those warning signs. We're not ignoring uh, the potential badness that could get introduced. And to the degree that we can, we're automating those checks to make sure that we're not putting a drag on that velocity. And so, guys, that's kind of what I wanted to show. Uh, we're at about uh, just about at time. So let me uh, let me go ahead and actually. Uh, stop my, my portion of the demo here and maybe turn it back over to Mark.
Great, Bob. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and you know, it's really interesting that the tool chain throws off so much data. And so it's so important to be able to uh, continuously sort of summarize and, and have a way to, uh, to see the, uh, you know, forest through the trees, so to speak. Um, so I thought that was a really good demonstration. If there's any questions, please, this is a great time to, to, to ask them. Um, and we also want to offer and let you know that we have a, a, a in, in Bob, one thing we really didn't really talk about is sort of how we can deliver the solution either on prem or we have our OpsMX Intelligent Cloud. Yes, well. I was I was negligent there. So let me let me if you don't mind, let me talk about yeah, that for please. just a moment. Right. So so, so sure. I think, you know, one of the things that, that we've done here at OpsMX is uh, we understand that, you know, um, deploying something like Spinnaker um, you know, uh, can be a challenge. And so we, we have a number of different sort of deployment strategies, but I think the one that we're most excited about is, uh, you know, our OpsMX cloud, our intelligent cloud. And, and really what we've done there is we've taken everything that I've just shown you and we've short circuited the, you know, the, the deployment and the, the setup and configuration and just give you the tool to use. You have access to it. It can interact with through our agent-based technology, uh, any any on-premise resources that it needs to. Uh, it obviously can access through our agent-based technology any of the Kubernetes clusters that it needs to. So we're uh, providing you through the OpsMX Intelligent Cloud that you know sort of real turnkey solution with all the power of Spinnaker in our la layer of intelligence without all of the setup and configuration that's required. So, um, and, and Mark, I, I know I should have uh, probably plugged this earlier, but uh, I wanted to make sure I got that in. Oh, there. Perfect timing, I mean, because again, we, we were offering this 15 day trial, it's on our website, there's your URL. Um, and really appreciate everybody's time today. If you have any other questions, info at opsmx.io, more than happy to answer anytime. Bob and I are available anytime for you guys and girls. And I just want to wish everybody a great day. Uh, thank you very much, Bob. And thanks everybody for, uh, for taking the time to uh, understand and get a, a faster, safer, happier deployment of Kubernetes, which is always good. Okay, everybody. Thanks a lot, all. Bye-bye. <laughs>